Hey, Brett Hickman, head football coach at West Brunswick High School down in Shalote, North Carolina. Uh, opening up this thing we call Coach Conversations with high school and college head coaches across the state, uh, trying to promote our association, the Eastern North Carolina Football Coaches Association. Um, brought in today the head coach of my alma mater and kind of the school that sits right in our backyard, Coach Mike Houston, who's no stranger to North Carolina high school football. Uh, was the head coach at T.C. Robertson High School in Asheville for five years, compiling a 42-18 and 18 record. And he's been the head coach at Lenore Ryan, the Citadel, uh, James Madison at those three places. He won six conference championships in the FCS National Championship at James Madison, also took Lenore Ryan to the National Championship game in 2013. And he is entering his second year at East Carolina. Coach, how you doing today, man? Doing pretty good. Trying to navigate, uh, you know, all this craziness just like everybody else, but uh, doing well. You have two children, like two boys, like I do. Yours are a little bit old. Are you ready to put them in the transfer portal yet? Oh, there's no doubt. So, you know, today was the first day of true online school, and uh, I think my wife's about ready to choke both of them. So, uh, we'll see. We'll see if we can get through this segment without some kind of meltdown here at the house. Well, I had to come outside just to get a little bit of peace and quiet and some sun. We have a, a seven-month-old who doesn't seem to want to let us do anything. So, <laughs> anyway, we appreciate you giving us time for sure. professional development and chance to talk about your program a little bit and hit, hit your background a little bit and take you back 20 years. Probably doesn't seem that long to you, but you take over the T.C. Robertson head job, um, which in Asheville, you're chasing Bobby Paul said A.C. Reynolds, I'm sure, is the head coach. Danny Wilkins got that thing going at Asheville High at the same yep. time. Um, but by your third or fourth year, you guys are playing in the Western Championship game. Can you kind of go back and talk about building your high school program and, and how you found some of those foundational principles uh, that you're still using today? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's such a different animal at the high school level because of, you, know, you can't really recruit outside of your school, or at least you're not supposed to. Um, so you really, you know, you kind of, you have the hand you're dealt with. And so, um, you know, I, I, I'd been there at TC for a couple of years as an assistant. So I knew kind of what the community was and what it wasn't. Um, I thought the real key, there were two or three real keys for us, um, you know, in getting that uh, program going there, you know, one was, um, I had a principal take over about the same time I, I took over as the head coach and he was a former football coach. He helped me establish, um, you know, weight room classes year round for my JV and varsity football players. You know, something I hadn't done in the past there. So, you know, when you came in as a freshman, um, you had general PE in the fall of your freshman year. And then every semester after that, you had weight training, you had block schedule. So you had it for an hour and a half. So I had a JV class and a varsity class. Every kid was in it. And you look at, you know, we, we created that my first year as the head coach there, my fourth year there. So the, the freshmen would have been seniors. They'd been through it all four years was the team that went undefeated and went to the Western conference finals, you know, lost to the eventual state champion Shelby Crest. So, um, and, and I really, I cannot underestimate the importance of that for a couple of reasons. Um, number one there at TC, you had some skill kids, you had some kids that could run walk in the halls, we were able to recruit those kids to come out uh, that had not played in the past. So we had some speed. What we didn't have were, you know, the linemen, linebackers, tight ends, those kind of those kind of bodies. And so that weight class, along with, you know, really getting the community to buy into it, talking to parents, you know, putting kids on diets, weight gain diets, nutrition plans, uh, you know, we were able to build our linemen. We identified kids early on and we're able to build those linemen and linebackers and those bigger body types over the span of those four years through that weight training class. So I thought that was critical from a development of our roster. The second thing that I thought was really important about that class was, you know, through that weight room, and I think this is true at any high school um, anywhere in the country, through that weight room, we were able to develop um, our, our culture. We were able to build our culture uh, you know, with the way we operated, uh, the things that were important to us, uh, you know, from an accountability standpoint, from a training standpoint, um, you know, all those things you're able to implement and build on a daily basis all throughout the year. And so the consistency of that 
you know, we built a lot of toughness. We became a hard-nosed, very physical football team. Uh, you know, really, you know, the, the attention to detail, the, you know, how hard we played. Um, everything in your culture was built through that weight room also. So I thought those, you know, those factors right there were really, really critical um, to us taking a program that had, you know, had very limited success ever, uh, you know, in the sport of football and turning into what was at that time, you know, one of the better 3A football teams in the state. Right. You know, so you've got the thing going there and then you just massive leap of faith. I think you go to Brevard for a year. Am I right on that? Yeah. Six not months. exactly a football factory. And no, well, you know what? Yeah, and, and I remember when I took the job. Uh, I took the job as a defense coordinator at Brevard College, startup program. I had uh, a couple of my friends that were at other universities, you know, around the state, um, you know, call me like, you know, Mike, if you wanted to get into college coaching, why don't you call us? You know, that's not a good move for you. But, you know, it may not be from the outside looking in, but really, you know, it was – it was an opportunity for me to learn how to recruit. It was an opportunity for me to learn the, you know, the differences in game planning, learning the differences and just how you operated with minimal pressure there for one year. And I thought really that was a, a good transition for me going from a, a high school situation to the college level. You know, you've been at both. You understand, you know, what I mean by that as far as the differences in the daily operation. Right. Well, I think me and you had this conversation when you came down to, to West Brunswick this winter to see JVN play basketball. You were actually the offensive play caller at Robertson, were you not? Right. Okay. And so, but you get on the defensive side of the ball in college, and that's really been your hallmark. So you go to Little Ryan, you work for Coach Goldsmith for a while, and then he, he really did a great job orchestrating that turnaround there. But then you're thrust into a head coaching job um, at a place where they do care about football a little bit. Right. Where you're going. It's, it's obviously been magnified at a higher level. What do you think were the advantages of taking over a program that you were already involved in, in the case of Lenore Ryan? Well, you know, with Coach Goldsmith, we kind of together went through the lean years. You know, you know, it, it was, I'll tell you, it was a couple of dark days there, the first couple of seasons we were there. Um, but we were able to build a solid roster. And we're able to, uh, um, you know, develop that, you know, hard-nosed, uh, you know, mentally tough, uh, very physical culture. Uh, and we did that all together. Um, and, you know, we – those kids had been in the program, you know, we had, we had – kids had been in the program for four or five years. So they, they understood the culture. They understood the expectations. We had had some success, uh, had a winning season the year before I took over. So those kids, they knew me, they trusted me. Uh, the success that we had defensively uh, the year before, we were one of the top defenses in the country. Um, you know, that allowed, uh, you know, a little bit of legitimacy uh, there on the front end. Now, if we hadn't won the way we did, you know, out of the, out of the, out of the, the, the gate, um, you know, probably wouldn't turn out the way it did. But uh, we had a tremendous amount of success from day one. Uh, you know, I can think back to the turning points there that first season, but really it was the foundation that we built, very similar to TC, the foundation that we built there uh, in those early years with Coach Goldsmith that allowed us to have the success that we had uh, there during my time as head coach. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because I had coached against you at LR and then at the Citadel, and I think whether or not you want the reputation or you don't. I mean, I realize you're the defensive coordinator going into the, the head coach and you're calling the defense, but you guys are a triple option team. You know, right. that's, your, that's what you're known for. That's carried right. the national championship game. It's gotten you to the F, FCS level. Obviously, you, you work miracles at the Citadel. You go in, you beat South Carolina, you win the Southern Conference Championship. Then you transition to James Madison. Was there apprehension of leaving the triple option because it had been so good to you, or was the decision was I, we can't do we can't win a national championship doing this? You know, just the ideas because you have so many high school coaches that are tied to right. the, the the triple option. Um, just your ideas of why you made that switch after it that offense had been kind of part of your identity. 
No, I mean, I, I believe in the triple option. I mean, I, I think it's a, a great offense. Um, you know, obviously it was the reason we won the way we did, like you said, at Lenore Ryan and the Citadel. Um, if I had taken the wishbone to James Madison and installed it there, we would have won at a very high level. Uh, it was more, you know, looking at that offense and, and looking at where I was in my career. Yeah, I was labeled as a defensive guy. Um, I was fairly young for a head coach. Uh, I knew that if I stayed with the triple option, it was really going to limit what schools I had job opportunities uh, at across the country. You know, there's only a few institutions that really embrace, uh, you know, being that style of offense. Um, and, you know, James Madison, from the, from the minute I first started uh, researching it and from the first time I stepped on campus, I knew this. There, that was a situation where you could win a national championship. Uh, and I wanted to get relabeled per se uh, as far as a head coach, as a spread offensive head coach. Now, you know, we, Donnie Kirkpatrick, air raid guy, uh, you know, had that kind of background. I thought he did a great job of taking what I wanted to do offensively and incorporating it into his system, did a lot of research, and really we became a power uh, you know, heavy, heavy, hard nose, run the ball, spread football team there at JMU. And, uh, you know, we had a tremendous amount of success because you can recruit at a very high level there. Right. You know, I think the one thing, though, what did you have to change in terms of how you practice? Because I know the triple option was <clears throat> half line drills. You've got to work cut. Yeah. You have to do all that. I mean, are you just kind of tinkering that first spring at JMU or – uh, obviously, you said you're doing a lot of studying to try and combine air raid principles and everything, but you still wanted that hard nose, right. hard line toughness that your teams are known for, and you guys were able to achieve it. I, yeah, I found it really hard because we're trying right. from a wing tee to a more spread concept. Uh, what would you say to coaches going through uh, those transitions? I think I think you guys stick to what you believe in. Um, and yeah, you know, some of my offensive coaches kind of looked at me sideways a couple of times when, you know, some of the things I had us do team wise, but I wanted to be a team that could run the football with a very physical nature. And I wanted to be a, a team that could stop the run on defense. I thought those, those things were very important. And I wanted a hard nosed physical football team. And so, you know, the thing, the same things that we hung our hat on at Lenore Ryan and the Citadel were the same things that we tried to develop culture wise you know, there at JMU, um, physical toughness, mental toughness, team first attitude, you know, play with a tremendous amount of intensity, um, you know, you know, really physical to point of contact on the line of scrimmage, you know, uh, very aggressive in all three phases. You know, I think special teams, I think that's uh, a reflection of what kind of defensive team you are. Uh, we, we try to take those same principles and same things that we believed in uh, and, and bring them to a spread offense. Uh, and I, I thought we did that, you know, fairly effectively. I, I still believe uh, you build your football team through the weight room. Uh, so our strength coach, Big John Williams, was critical. Uh, and, but he does a great job of, you know, he's a football strength coach. And uh, he did a great job of his philosophies in the weight room were, you know, you know in step with our philosophies and my philosophies uh, as a head football coach. That's good. Um, going back, your first two jobs, I believe you still called the defense. Am I right? Lenore Ryan and the Citadel transition to go into a little bit more, I, I don't like the word hands off, but you're not a caller. What does that, what did you have a struggle with that? Was it kind of natural? Um, you know, because I know you've, you've always let Brent call the place for you at LR and the Citadel and then Donnie's been with you at the last two spots, but defensively the dynamics of being a defensive head coach in those game plan meetings and those things, you know, how have you handled that transition? Well, yeah, you know, certainly at first it was something you're very resistant because it's what you've always done. Uh, but uh, I felt like for us to be successful at the highest level, uh, I had to uh, you know step away from that role. Uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, could I do a great job of being the head coach in an environment where you have a lot of things pulling you in a lot of different directions uh, and still do the job as far as the, the research, 
the film study, I mean, the in-depth nut, nuts and bolts stuff that you got to do, uh, you know, to do a great job as a coordinator. Uh, and the answer was, it was going to be a real strain. And, uh, you know, I felt like it was important going in there. Uh, we inherited a very divided locker room. I felt like it was important that the offensive players saw me as their head coach every bit as much as the defensive kids did. Uh, and that's, you know, that's one negative of being a play caller uh, and, and, and being a head coach is, you know, your, your players are going to see as one or the other. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that, uh, you know, those things outweighed, you know, my desire to continue to call plays. I was fortunate enough to hire a guy that had been one of my mentors, Bob Trott. He did a tremendous job. So it wasn't like I was turning it over to somebody that I, that I didn't have faith in. Uh, I've been able to do the same thing here at East Carolina now with Blake Harrell coming on board. You know, a guy that I've got a tremendous amount of confidence in, a uh, tremendous amount of faith in. So uh, when you have that kind of confidence in your play callers, and I'm still very involved from the standpoint of I'm very involved in the, in the meetings, uh, very involved in practice. But, you know, I do have a guy that I trust very much is going to be the down-in and down-out play caller. Talk about – you mentioned, Blake, you got Trip Weaver back with you, Roy Tesh. A lot of these guys go back with you five, <clears throat> six, seven years. And I've talked football with a lot of them. They, you know, obviously – and I've watched your teams play over the years, and y'all have been awfully good, but you've had good young coaches. You know, how do you go about – I guess, helping their careers, if you will, really identifying young coaching talent. Um, you know, when you know, Blake's still a relatively young guy and he's right. calling football, or he's going to be calling plays at some of the highest levels now going with that. You know, you're trusting young coaches because I know it's really hard, um, even at my level, to coach coaches. Um, right. You know, what do you do with those guys and trying to help them? Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing is identifying, um, identifying guys with talent. I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, you look on the offensive side of the ball, I feel like I have three really bright young coaches there, two in Drew Dudzik, Fontel Mines, and Darrell Sims. And I think back to, you know, identifying them, it, it, just, it just comes down to, you know, identifying somebody that has, has the intelligence, you know, has the football IQ, uh, somebody that has the personality, the ability to relate to the players, the ability to relate to prospects, uh, and somebody that has that strong work ethic that's needed. Uh, and if you can identify, it doesn't matter their age, you can identify that they have those things, then, you know, you can develop them as a coach. And I think it's, uh, you know, our, our our staff meetings, our side of the ball meetings, uh, you know, our dialogue we have uh, in those in those rooms. Um, I, I, encourage, I encourage discussion. You know, it's never going to be, you know, Blake's going to call the defense uh, this year, but it's not, you know, just Blake Harrell. It's a group deal. Uh, and I think it's important to have dialogue because I think that's where those young coaches learn is some of the some of the best sessions I ever had were, you know, borderline arguments that Fred Goldsmith and I would have about how to defend certain things that we were seeing. But, the, but that dialogue really led to the development of our defense and our scheme. Uh, and I think that was, you know, his way of developing me. Uh, you know, it's kind of the same thing with the young coaches on our staff. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, GAs, young guys just getting in, uh, you know, absorb as much knowledge as you can, but also don't, don't sit there and be a knot on the log either. You know, ask questions, be, you know, generate discussion because that's how you learn. No doubt. So now let's get to East Carolina, obviously a lot of, a lot of alums in our part of the state that are coaching right. that you know keep tabs on how the pirates are doing um going into your second year you inherit a little bit of a fractured program i'm not sure um even with your predecessor that the, the program recovered from you know kind of the the firing of ruffin mcneil if you will right a fractured deal in a tough league i don't think people really realize how good your league is right now right when you went in there, I guess, last November, last December, what are the one, two, threes of things that you thought you had to get done uh, to bring East Carolina football back to where it's been historically under Pat Dye or Steve Logan or Skip right. or Ruffin McNeil? Well, I think, number one, we had to establish expectations of what we wanted to be. Uh, and, you know, there was not a whole lot of confidence and not a whole lot of brightness uh, in the program. 
you know, you, you think about it outside looking in from, from an alumni's perspective, I can promise you it, it was the same kind of feeling inside the locker room. So tried to establish um, expectations of what we're going to be uh, from day one, try to establish a certain culture uh, from a positive reinforcement, uh, you know, positive mindset, um, you know, uh, generating, you know, daily uh, protocols for how we're going to operate. Um, and then it's just consistency, you know, uh, consistency day in and day out that your, your, your expectations aren't going to change. Uh, your core values aren't going to change. Your standard operating procedures aren't going to change. You know, this, yeah, we're going to work hard today. We're going to be on time today. We're going to be that way tomorrow, the next day, you know, the, the formula doesn't change. And you talk about embracing the, the process. You hear that so many times in our industry. Um, that's what the process is. The process is your daily standard, uh, you know, way of operation, your core values and things you believe in. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had a roster where, you know, didn't really come in trying to, you know, clean house or do anything like that. Um, really tried to um, uh, embrace everybody. But the, the fact of the matter is not everybody could uh, consistently um, operate in that setting. You know, the process weeded out so many guys that, uh, you know, did not have, um, you know, the traits and the intangibles that were so important to us as a program. Um, so, you know, the, the other part that's, uh, you know, probably the most critical part is the recruiting. So, you know, you sit here 14 months later, uh, the process has uh, resulted in us having a roster that we have a lot of youth. Uh, there have been a lot of older players that you know, just couldn't cut it. Um, we have, in our opinion, a lot of really talented young players. Uh, and, you know, the, it's the frustrating thing about the situation we're in with this virus is the morale and the energy in the program has never been higher than it was uh, when we broke for spring break. And uh, you know, everybody around the program was so excited for spring practice, and we've had to hit the pause button right now. But uh, you know, those are the things we tried to establish coming in. And it was a painful first year. I knew it would be. Uh, I knew what I was getting into. But I do know this: uh, it's a it's too good of a place. I mean, it is. I'm telling you, this place has the potential to be you know everything it always has been, and everything that we all want it to be. Uh, and it's only a matter of time before it's back. I mean, it's just, there's just too many positive things to recruit to uh, that in time, you're going to be able to get the players, get the talent in there. Uh, you're going to be able to, to, to develop a roster that can play at a very, very high level. And I'm excited about this fall. I think we're going to be a lot of fun to watch. I think we've got some exciting playmakers on the offensive side of the football. I think we've got some young guys on defense that are going to play, you know, play the game the way it's supposed to be played. So, uh, we're, we'll be glad when we get out of, uh, you know, out of the, the situation that we're in with quarantine. Yeah, no doubt. Kind of my last question, even the 13 years since I've been going from there, recruiting right. dynamics have changed because you added Appalachian to the FBS. You've added Charlotte. How much is – how much are you having to expand the recruiting territory outside of just the Eastern North Carolina footprint all the way to Charlotte? And I mean, I know you guys did, and did a great job in South Carolina. He's right. traditionally done a great job in the Tidewater of Virginia. How far north do you want to go? How far south do you want to go? Um, you know, kind of your overall geographic ideals on recruiting. Well, I mean, I think you know, there's lots of other factors, too, with the recruiting deal. Um, you know, the academic uh, standards are higher now than, than they have been in the past, East Carolina. Um, our conference, uh, you know, has high academic standards also. So that's created a little bit of a different dynamic. But, you know, number one, we're going to recruit home base. You know, if there is a if there is a top tier player in the eastern part of the state, if there's a top tier player anywhere in the Carolinas, then they are going to have an opportunity to be at East Carolina University. Uh, we want to take care of home first. Uh, but you're right. You know, there's you think about how many more. FBS programs there are regionally now than there were 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the numbers, I don't know what the exact, you know, data is, but I would say it may have even doubled. Yep. Uh, so, you know, our footprint's going to be, you know, East coast, 
New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, DC, Baltimore, Virginia, a little bit in Pennsylvania, uh, a little bit in Ohio, um, all the way down through Florida, uh, heavy in Georgia. Uh, you know, we're going to go, you know, mainly to Orlando in Florida, but we're going to get a little bit, a little bit uh, farther south uh, with some of the additions to staff that we've uh, gained with Steve Ellis coming on. Uh, we've done quite a bit in, uh, in Texas, in the Houston and Dallas area. Uh, we've done a lot in the junior colleges and the Jayhawk conference, and, uh, we're going to be, you know, recruiting the junior colleges in Mississippi, uh, and then spot recruiting in, you know, Tennessee, Alabama, those areas. But, uh, you know, but home base is going to be the most important, the most important piece. We would prefer to get guys from within three hours uh, of Greenville. Right. Well, you know, I'm going to give you one. I know we're, all just trying to get our message out to our own players, our own fans, our own communities. Anything you want to say to the high school coaches of Eastern North Carolina and Pirate Nation in general, um, you know, because all of us alums are a little upset. We thought we might make a run to Omaha this year for our baseball team and certainly excited about what you're doing, but I'll give you the floor to say what you want to say to those guys. Well, first, you know, to the, to the high school coaches, just thank you for what you do. Uh, certainly, I know your job. Uh, and it's got a whole lot. Uh, it's got a whole lot more than football uh, tied to it. So uh, I respect very much the job that our our coaches do in the Carolinas, uh, and especially the eastern part of the state, being that that's you know our home base. But uh, just thank you for your commitment. Um, I want everyone to know that uh, you know we are committed to the high school coaches too. You know we want to be a resource to you. We want to be a, a place that you feel comfortable. Uh, if you need any kind of assistance, if you want to come and clinic. If you want to come watch practice, uh, you know, we want to be very accessible uh, to the high school coaches. That's something that's very important to me because that's something that I always, you know, tried to find when I was a high school coach. Um, you know, to, to, to Pirate Nation, uh, and I would say this to the high school coaches too because so many of you are Pirates. Um, I couldn't be more excited uh, in, 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 in where I go to work every day. Uh, I take a lot of pride in being the head football coach at ECU. Uh, and I meant what I said a while ago uh, about the positive energy and enthusiasm of the program right now. Uh, it's brighter right now than it was a year ago. It's only going to continue to get brighter. And uh, as we build this thing together, you're going to see uh, a lot of positive energy around our program. And you're going to see us year in, year out, continue to improve. And I think you'll look up in a couple of years and you'll see us be one of the better teams in the American Conference, which means we're going to be com competing at a very high level nationally. So. Uh, you know, stay with us, stay behind us, uh, and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna keep fighting till we get the program where it's supposed to be and where everybody wants it to be. All right, guys, that does it for episode one of Coach's Conversation from the Eastern North Carolina Football Coaches Association. Coach Houston, we appreciate you, and um, look forward to following the progress of the Pirates this fall. Thank you again. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate what you're doing, Brett, and excited to have JV on with us. Go yeah, Pirates! He looks good right now. So thank you. Sure thing.